everybody, my name's Jake from Biological Services and uh, I'm just going to give a, a little bit of an update on some of the new technologies we have um, in, the, yeah, in the IPM industry and then after that Lachlan's just going to give a bit of an update on chilli thrips which is um, yeah, in uh, various berry crops in Western Australia at the moment. I'm just going to start with a little bit of a video. So this is the, uh, the new sachet machine we have. Um, these are slow release predatory mite sachets and they're not entirely replacing loose material with predatory mites but they do have very, um, a wide range of applications in berry crops. So you can see here, um, this is where they're printing on the date that the sachets are made and punching a little hole for the predatory mites to emerge from. Um, then they come down and the little bits of paper get rolled around into a tube and then they're filled with the mix of um, predatory mites and prey mites and food. Um, it's actually about four or five different components in this machine. It's not actually just one individual part. And um, <clears throat> it's, they've been in Europe for about 20 years already and they're widely used there, but this is an Australian first so we're really excited to have a new tool that we can try on a, on a wide range of crops and with a, a range of four different predators. Uh, automatically comes out in boxes of 500 and um, there's usually a few extras in there, I think 16 or 20, um, just to make sure we've got yeah, 500 and a few more. Um, there's a small hole there that you can see where the predatory mites can emerge. If you haven't already seen them, this is what they look like. That's how big they are. Um, you might have seen them on our stand already. Some of the benefits um, and the reason why we are trying to do more with sachets are that it's simplified releases, so it's a lot easier to tell that your staff and the people releasing an exact um, you know, distance to release, so it, it might be every second or third plant in a raspberry or blackberry, or you might say every you know, three or two slabs in strawberries, depending on the release rate, but it, it makes it very easy if you know exactly how many sachets you have and, and how much area to treat. Um, with loose material, often you can get to the end of the row and you, you might find that you've run out because you've gone quite heavy in one area and a bit lighter in other areas. Um, so yeah, it guarantees even placement of the predators. And there's no need to guess how much you're putting out each time. And there's a lot less mess compared to loose material. So often with many crops, uh, some of that loose material might be falling on the ground, particularly with plants grown in gutters. It's a little bit of a waste if your predators are going on the ground and, and not into your crop. Uh, and then we really like to come back and monitor once we've put out predators to make sure they're actually in the crop and doing what we want. And so that can be hard when it's you know quite close to the, the time that you've released them. Often it takes a few weeks before the predators to, to build up and start to be found easily through the crop, but we really want to come out you know, five, six days later and be able to make sure that they're there and alive. So knowing where the sachet is and being able to see it easy, we can come back and detect them early just to make sure they're doing what we want. And there's reduced labour costs as well because these can replace um, sometimes two to three releases of loose material. That's because they're slow release, so they actually will emerge over three to five weeks time. Um, the bulk of them are emerging from week two uh, and then three and four. So um, we're able to have a longer window of protection. So instead of putting loose material out and you're having your whole population released in one go, um, if there's not much food from there, there's not many pests at the time, uh, the population can, can dwindle without a food source there. So it just guarantees that we've got a constant flow of predatory mites coming out, so you're more likely to hit that window when the pests are coming in. Uh, you can get them out a little bit earlier as well, as we saw in the last, the last slide there with some long cane raspberries. There's actually no foliage on them, just the buds breaking. Um, but often they can get mites, two-spotted mite, quite quick at that stage. So if we're doing loose material, we almost need to wait for a bit of foliage there to, to put the loose material out, and then a lot of that can end up on the ground. Um, so having the slow release and the, and the sachet technology, we can get them out a lot earlier. Um, and it does provide a little bit of protection from some sprays. So often you might, you might put predatory mites out, but then a secondary pest like myrids or stink bugs is causing problem. And those are things that can interrupt an IPM program still because often we have to do contact sprays. So <clears throat> if you've had your sachets out for two or three weeks and you do have to do an application of an insecticide, 
you've still got a population in there that continue to emerge after. So as long as it's not a highly um, residual product, you might be getting contact on the population that's already emerged, but you'll still get some emerging um, after the spray applications. We're using them in all sorts of different crops, protected vegetables, um, fruit, but yeah, berries is an industry where we think um, they're gonna have quite, quite a big impact. So we're already using them in um, most berry crops. So we're using Californicus for two-spotted mite control uh, in strawberries, raspberries, and blackberries. Um, Californicus for broad mite in blackberries and raspberries is a big one as well. And Cucumerus for thrips in strawberries. Uh, and Montarensis for white fly and thrips. And we can use those in strawberries, raspberries, or blackberries. And we think there may be some potential in, blue, uh, in blueberries as well uh, for thrips and white fly. So particularly for those um, softer varieties and when they're grown under tunnels. Uh, at the moment we have, um, yeah, we have Cucumerus, we have Californicus and Montarensis. Uh, we also have Dorine, which is another predator. Um, so we're still, yeah, we haven't put a lot of those out yet, but there might be some applications in, in berries for those as well. Um, another thing, uh, many people may have already seen these, but it's basically a new package and delivery mechanism for one of our main predators in strawberries, which is the Aureus. So it replaces some of the old packaging. Um, some of it was plastic. So the good thing about these is they're biodegradable, but they also have, um, I'll show you here. This is the material, which is a, a buckwheat husk. But in the bottom of that, um, container we have a gel which has um, yeah, has moisture and also nutrients so it's something that the aureus can feed on during transport so it keeps them healthier uh, more active and uh, these breathe quite well so there's a lot less mortality during transport there's always some degree of of mortality when you're transporting uh, bugs around in containers um, but we find these arrive much more active and ready to go um, when they get on the farm and there's smaller packaging sizes as well. So we, we do have two sizes. They both have the same amount of predators in them. Um, but a small package like this, we can still fit um, over 2,000 aureus in there, which is like around 50 release points of 40 aureus per, per release point. Um, and we can fit something like 68 of these in a box compared to 50 of, of some other packaging in the small area. So it's efficient for, for transport and um, a bit cheaper on freight, which is quite important at the moment. And as I said, they're biodegradable, so you can just leave these in the field and they'll, they'll completely break down. So well, that's all for the, um, for the new technologies. And now Lachlan's just going to talk a bit about chili thrips. All right. Um, thanks, Jake. Just on the on the sachets, probably something we um, we didn't mention was about transport. Uh, so it's you might have seen the boxes; they've uh, got quite large holes in them. So in the past, we we send most of our beneficials um, in eskies with um, ice packs, um, but the heat that they generate is is quite high. Um, you have uh, you know hundreds, if not thousands, of of prey mites and and predators in each of those sachets. So if you've got 500 in a box, so there's a particular way that we need to um, package the, uh, the pallets when we transport them around Australia. So it's uh, communication with us, with the growers um, and the managers and the workers about when they get them, how to store them, um, and just to make sure they're in good condition when they arrive. But that's just a quite an important aspect of it. Um, I, I thought it might be important, um, what we're seeing in Western Australia, especially in the last two, three months about chili thrips, to just give the industry a bit of a, an update. Um, we've obviously had our fair share of um, incursions over the last few years in Australia and in Western Australia we had a huge issue with TPP, tomato potato psyllid, um, it caused huge issues with growers and quarantine. But to this point it hasn't spread to other parts of Australia and it hasn't really caused the growers in Western Australia any economic loss what we see. But this pest here, um, what we've seen in a very short period is, is, is really a really big issue. Um, so I'll just, I was just going to give a quick update, some photos, what the damage looks like, um, so you can, you can be aware of it in the field. So just, uh, it's a, a very interesting one, where it's been reported in Western Australia over 20 years ago, um, but I've, I've been in Western Australia for 20 years and we've never seen it before, and I don't think any growers have seen it before. Um, last year, um, 
a number of rose growers um, in their homes were ringing up saying their roses aren't producing flowers anymore. Uh, so we went and had a look and um, yeah, and it was identified as chili thrips. So we saw a bit of that um, last season and we saw a little bit, just a little bit in some in berries. Um, we, a lot of people at apartments said, oh, it's just a one in 20 year occasion and it'll disappear. Um, this year, um, in the summertime, nearly every single rose grower in Perth in their backyard, so you're talking tens of thousands of backyards, uh, they didn't produce any roses. Um, it's a foliage feeder, so it, it doesn't attack your roses as your flowers, it affects the foliage. It looks like you sort of put petrol on them and nearly burn them. So um, that was our summertime. As if you know in Perth, it's extremely hot and dry. Um, and, and then the, the thoughts were that once we start the berry season, that the chili thrips would disappear as it's more humid and, and cooler. Um, but this, this has not happened at all. So um, we've had the, the growers that have kept second year plants over the summer um, hugely affected and stunted with those and it's moved into the first years. Um, and I'll show you some photos in a moment, but blackberries are heavily affected to the point that it's stunting them and sending them three, four, five weeks backwards with the new growth. Um, yeah, so probably the main thing, we, we honestly don't know why they're here in such levels and they're in plague proportions. So it's not just you have a, a small outbreak here or there, it's the whole, whole of the Perth Metro is um, infested with them. Um, and I, I don't know, uh, we, we're not, I'll run over it in a second, but there's not a lot of great research overseas. Um, but I did go to the Middle East a month ago to a greenhouse strawberry production and, and they were full of chili thrips. So it may be something that's spreading a little bit more around the world. So with strawberries, um, if you can see from those photos, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a foliage feeder. Um, it doesn't really affect flowers so much, um, but it gets into the crown of the plants. So the adults and the juveniles, they'll be in the crowns feeding. And so as those leaves come out of the crown, they'll be deformed. So it looks like a heavy spray, a spray burn on those, those new shoots. Something else that you can see um, on the stems there, the, instead of them being green, they'll go quite a dark color. So that's another indication that you could have um, chili thrips and that bubbling is, is quite, uh, quite a standout feature of the leaf. So, yeah, so we don't see, as I said, a lot of damage to the flowers, but they do cause a lot of bronzing to the fruit. Um, so I guess from our experience and a lot of people in the room over the last 20 to 30 years, we've initially had plague thrips in the spring that can cause a bit of seediness and bronzing and then we've battled western flower thrips for the last 20 or 30 years. Um, so I guess comparing it, the foliage feeding is, is different, um, but they do cause severe bronzing to the fruit. This is strawberries. So wh what are we trying to do? Um, we, we have used a lot of chemicals um, over the the autumn to try and reduce them. We've used our traditional thrip sprays, you know, anything from, you know, Success, your Maldisons, your Vertimex, Abermectins, I should say, and it does knock them down. But unlike plague thrips that if you get a good spray, they, they, uh, they don't normally come back till the next plague, these guys keep breeding in the crop. So we've got blackberry crops where we've applied six or seven sprays and um, over a four to five week period and, and they're back in the same levels two weeks later. So, yeah, so I'd, we're hoping that we could do a clean up spray and uh, resume our normal IPM programs, but it hasn't quite been the case. And as I stand here, we don't know if next year will chili thrips will disappear, um, but two years in a row, it's starting to become a little bit more of a consistent problem. Um, so we, we are doing a lot of trials with the beneficials because of um, the effects of the chemicals haven't been that, that effective. Um, Cucumerus is one um, that we are doing a lot of releases um, and we are, we are seeing a, a result, but it's still too early for us to stand up here and say what predators um, we, we recommend to use. Um, but we are going really heavy releases and working our, our way backwards to see if we do see a response. Um, so probably for the blackberry growers, uh, there's probably not a huge amount of blackberries grown in Australia yet, but that's probably the one that really shocked us. Um, they, they completely stunted the plants. Um, and so this was plants that were um, in their real vegetative early stage and it, it set them back like broad mites. So I don't know if growers have seen severe broad mite in blackberries, but um, this looked exactly like it. Um, so that's something that um, 
yeah, really, really have a look out there. You can see the growing tips um, that they attack and then you see the mottling on the blackberry leaves after that. Um, so where are we around the world with controlling chili thrips? Um, we, we do have avenues to speak to other people around the world, but there's not a lot of solid information. Um, you speak to people in Israel and it's affecting sweet peppers and things like that, but they're in the same boat where it's relatively new, the, the damage and the controls that they have. Um, so they're looking at you know, all, all different types of predators um, that they could use. Um, th these could be Swirsky that we don't have in Australia. They, they do think that works quite well. Um, Lamonicus is another one. Um, we have Laley in Australia, but it's a very hard predator to rear. Um, some of the work that's come out overseas is um, obviously mentioned Cucumerus is one that can, can help, um, and that's something that we're, we're trialling a lot at the moment. Um, so, yeah, it's still, still quite new, um, what we're doing. But the, the biggest difference that we've seen in the field in observations, um, even with the rose crops in Perth um, in February and March when it can be 35, 40 degrees, uh, it's a very different trip to monitor. Um, on the rose buds, you actually find them up the top of the, of the rosebud in the middle of summer, in the middle of the day, and you could have 10 to 15 of them just circumnavigating the top of the flower. Um, normally, most crops that we work with thrips, they're normally in the flowers or, or hiding a bit, so um, they're, they're, not, they're not scared to be out in the environment, and I think that's where it becomes a little bit more challenging with predators, because a lot of the predatory mites like to hide under the calyxes and, and foliage, so um, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting beast. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to give a really quick update and um, hopefully next year we don't even have to talk about it, but um, we'll keep trialling about it, trialling things um, and we'll, we'll see where, where we end up. But we haven't seen or heard of it being in the east yet, um, but I, I guess, yeah, for the growers, just keep looking out there with the blackberries and um, obviously a lot of things can cause bronzing and strawberries, but um, yeah, just uh, if you do see some thrips on fruit or foliage, uh, it might be worth to try and get them ID'd. So thank you. Cool.